Uh, I'm Mike Sobis. I'm one of Dr. Campbell's nurse practitioners. Uh, he kind of started the uh, slides ahead of me. And uh, this next slide was actually, I go and present you with a little, like a little piece of paper and say, okay, we're gonna do a little test on this stuff so it freaks everybody out. And then I go into the next slide and say, only you know what you know. And would you want you taking care of you? Meaning that you can, you know, a lot of people will spit out, like I had nursing students from Hobby Community College that would say, you know, A and O times three, bone size table, blah, 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 blah. And then you'd ask them a question, they're like, uh, uh, because they memorize all the stuff and they don't really know what the real basis of it is. And so that's really what we're doing here today. Just to, you, you see lumbar decompressions and people think, okay, what's a decompression? Well, there's a lot of different stories to decompressions, which Dr. Campbell just explained to you. The lumbar decompression, you can have the microdiscectomy. Again, the disc is kind of bulging out. We just go in and clip off the piece that's bulging out and hitting the nerve. Then you have a laminectomy where we take the back shell of the spine off where it's gotten real arthritic and it's smashing down on the nerves and we pull that off. A laminotomy, uh, same kind of thing, but we're not really taking, if a hole is supposed to be this big for a nerve to go through and it's this big and the nerve is being irritated, we kind of go in and sand out the holes to make it bigger. So we're just making it a little bit bigger. The same thing with the foramen. That's where the nerves come out of the side. If it's real small, we make it bigger, and that's it. When <clears throat> you're so, doing that, how do you protect the nerve? You have a very shaky nurse practitioner that holds it up <laughs> <laughs> with sweat coming down his head, and the doctor saying, "No, you're not holding it right." <laughs> <laughs> There's a nerve uh, retractor, and so we have to pull back the nerve, and he's sanding, and he's got his loops on, and so you're kind of not seeing what he's seeing, but he's letting you know. So, um, so our deep lumbar decompressions, uh, this is kind of the aftercare and, and what we think about. They're going to have a dressing. Sometimes they have a drain, sometimes they don't, depending on how bloody uh, the case is or if the patient has had a history of taking aspirin or even if they say they're not, the surgeon knows that they've been taking something because they bleed a lot more than they should. Most of the times we suture. Every once in a while we will staple. It's very rare because if you staple, if something's gone wrong and you need a STAT MRI or something like that or a STAT CAT scan, you're going to get a lot of artifact and you're not going to see what's going on. Most of our patients will get Foley's. But a lot of times they'll be pulled in PACU, or if they come up, we want them pulled in the morning the next day. Uh, plus, if it's pulled, it encourages patients to get out of bed. Most all of our patients can get out of bed. I'll talk to the ones that, that can't. Uh, antibiotics, we usually do a dose in the uh, operating room, and then we will do one dose after that, and that's just empiric therapy, um, just to make sure that there's any critters there that we kill. Uh, labs. Uh, we try to get at least a CBC for the next morning. If they stay, we usually put CBCs for the next three days because we're wanting to look for any trending. Obviously, they're going to have a small dip, but if we see a big dip, we have to be concerned that they may have a slow bleed or something going into their soft tissues in their back. Vital signs, obviously, everybody neurovascular checks. <clears throat> um, really neuro, uh, if I could just focus on that for just a second, when you have a patient that has a cervical spine, and here's a very good example. Uh, not here. Uh, had a patient, she had a neck surgery because she was very, very compressed. Her spinal cord was hitting both sides up times here. So it, it was crushing her cord. And when that happens in the neck, it affects the way that you walk and you will become very myelopathic and feel like spaghetti legs. Like if you were walking on grass and, and a solid surface, they wouldn't be able to tell. Um, they can say sometimes their arms will start to have like this, they'll get fasciculations, the same thing in their legs. Well, this particular woman, uh, we had to decompress her neck, it was multiple levels, and I came into round this week and she said, oh my God, my leg doesn't stop moving, it's just, it's quivering. So I like 
you know, I hit her and she's got clonus. Clonus is if you hit the bottom of the feet, the feet start going back and forth. Well, that's a sign that the cord is really irritated. And she was doing the same thing. Well, she wasn't that bad before surgery. So the first thing that we have to think of, I called Dr. Campbell. I said, listen, I'm a little concerned about this patient. She's trying to get up a PT and she's walking all over the place because she can't negotiate her legs. So that can be a sign in the neck, even though that we did we didn't do low back surgery, we did neck surgery. So I want you to think about something like that if you see a patient like that. And so we did a stat MRI, we did stat um, to look to see if there was any blood that got into the cord and now is even smashing the cord down after surgery. It was clear, she just had a lot of swelling. So we've been giving her Decadron and I just saw her upstairs just now and she's doing laps around the hall and she's doing fine now. But I just, that's an idea that I wanted you to think about just because it's neck, it can affect the legs as well. Out of bed, we love to have all of our patients out of bed. Um, the asterisk is there. If patients go for lumbar surgery and they've had lumbar surgery before, uh, a naive back is going to have regular tissue planes that you're going to cut through and they're going to be fine. Somebody that's been operated on, you're going to have scar tissue. That scar tissue will sometimes attach to the sac, which we call the dura, that holds all the cerebral spinal fluid that the nerves are in, because the spinal cord ends about here, and then it turns into like horsehair fibers that come down. And so when we're going in to do the surgery and going through that tissue, that tissue sticks to the sac, and we pull off, then all of a sudden cerebral spinal fluid start coming out. So that's gonna be a dura leak and we're going to have to sew that up after you hear crap and then we'll <laughs> sew it up and that will be and then the patient will need to be on bed rest for 48 to 72 hours and lay flat because now there's pressure if i am laying flat the pressure on that sac isn't as heavy as if a person stands up all that fluid is going to the area that we just closed it makes the risk of it popping back open again. So that's the rationale for the flat. And obviously, the fact that DDT prophylaxis? Sure. Um, with all of our patients, none of them can uh, be on any uh, thinners. We don't want any heparin, um, obviously no thinners at all. Uh, so our, to us, good old fashioned nursing, AE hose, sequential compression device, and dorsiflex exercises. I remember 20 years ago, we'd have to document patient was taught dorsiflex exercise, blah, 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 because that really rules out, you know, I mean, a system in the uh, contraction of the calf muscles to push the blood back up to their heart. I was actually at another hospital, and they're not using AE hubs because their in-house study shows, and they've been reading the journals, that it's just sequential compression devices without the AE hubs. So I don't know if that's a trend that's going to be happening throughout the states, but we continue to use uh, AE hubs. Thank you. And part, part of the reason we use, I'd say more of the reason we use the hose during spine surgery, we are monitoring the spinal cord and nerve roots electrically with needles stuck all over the body. And you'll see on all these hose, there's little holes cut in them for, for, for blood. The, Neurology techs like the hose because they can stick the needle through or tape to it and it holds everything in place. So that's like the part of the unstated reason that we just let it continue, whether they're helpful or not. Other than in patients with arterial vascular insufficiency, where it's probably a bad idea to have to, to have the hose. Um, most everybody else doesn't matter, so we use them so that the needle will stick through it and stay there. Um, so on lumbar fusions, usually always there's a drain. So if you see a drain, our, our goal is less than 25 cc's, we'll pull the drain. If it's getting more than 25 cc's um, in 24 hours, I'd like to leave the drain because it just, you end up with a little hematoma or it starts to get worse in the patient and then they end up bruising then they're calling the office because their butt is yellow or it's purple and they want to know why, and so it's a lot easier if we can just get that fluid out in the drain. They always come up with a Foley because we do not want them out of bed until they have their brace. 
a lot of times we send our patients from the office to go get measured for a brace before they even come for surgery, and a lot of times they should come to the hospital with their braces. If they don't or they leave it at home, we don't want them out of bed unless they have their brace on. So it's going to either be the Ninja Turtle outfit or it's going to be the stealth brace. This is always a question that comes up with patients with the brace. Do you have to put it on in supine or can we put it on sitting at your bed? Because that is the hardest thing we teach is log roll, log roll, pull, get the brace on. Nobody leaves independent with Donnie unless there's a family member that can put it on for them. Are there certain cases, I mean, we just usually are going with safest practice in supine. We agree with that. If Since there's you know, any difference, if you could let us know, because it's always an argument. Yeah. And, don't and, like and I find the easiest argument to win is to <laughs> explain to the patient that we would prefer they just leave the brace on in bed and not take it off so that at 3 in the morning when they have to get up and pee, Exactly. They're not having to pee while they're trying to put a brace on and the nurse is busy or they're, you know, so uh, leave the brace on and just get used to it like a, a new pair of shoes. Um, this goes back, number three, strict bed rest, if there's a dural tear, see assembly. Transfuse. Most all of our patients, if we're going to do a lumbar fusion, we have them go do a self-directed uh, uh, deposit at the blood bank and then they come with that unit. In a perfect world we'd love to have them to have two units. There's some new protocol now that states that um, I guess nationwide patients with auto blood had uh, been being given to other patients but it had been within two weeks and there was some not some checks on certain diseases and there was some issues going on that other people were getting that blood. So now uh, Patients have, they cannot donate blood um, only two weeks or before, before the surgery. So we always try to give them that first unit and then we will give them a second unit if, we, if they've done it, uh, donated it, and then if not, then we would just give them uh, blood like blood if they need it. Right, and, and I would say if they have donated autologous blood, but the surgery is relatively bloodless and they come to the recovery room and post op and they do not have a notable change in their hemoglobin or hematocrit and they're not anemic, then we, we, we tend not to give them their autologous blood for the very reason that there can always be human error. So if they don't need the blood, don't give it to them. If they need it, give it to them. Um, but with the rule changes a week ago, that's my set. Uh, next thing is our, our PT group. We usually write for all of our patients for PT. Um, uh, a lot of times it's just that, it's education on how to get in and out of bed, how to, you know, get in, brush your teeth, how to not bend, twist, you know, the famous VLT, and uh, that's real important with every single one of the patients and even the patients. It's not so much about range of motion, and it's more about safety. So it's not about strengthening and everything. They just had surgery. All we want to do is a patient to go home that say that their gait is, they're able to negotiate their gait, um, that they're not going to fall. And if they are, and you say, listen, this patient's just not good, let us know, and we'll say, okay, you got to go to rehab or a nursing home, because that'll be the same patient that hits the floor at home. So, question about that. A lot of your necks, you have had a 35 degrees, but they leave the next day, so we like to practice with a bed flat and they're going home. How long do you want that to just the first night post-op or? Because most of the time their beds at home are typically flat and you want to practice. They're getting on the right, they're getting on the left, so they're safe and steady. <coughs> we don't have a big opinion either way, whatever, whatever works. And I'll, I'll just give you an example. We just operated on somebody two days ago that within an hour after surgery, after her neck was running around like going ready to go to dinner and then the opposite is the patient I told you about earlier with lots of comorbidities and reasons for the surgery to have been challenging, but he wound up with another operation on a vent for a while and he's not going to, you know, so there's a wide range of, of uh, differences that we can enter into a patient-specific or patient-centered answer to that question. So you just use your judgment on that patient, are they gurgling, are they coughing? Coughing is coughing is a little worrisome finding that 
is uh, understated. So if you have a cervical patient that's coughing and they weren't before, it's important to look at the wound. If they have a collar on, take it off and look and see and touch it. Take the bandage off and touch it and see if you feel the ipsilateral side of the surgery, meaning the same side as the surgery, whether it's left or right. If it's full, even if it doesn't look swollen, if it's, if it's hard and the other side's soft and they're coughing, you should report that because that could mean that they're having an expanding retropharyngeal, retrolaryngeal hematoma, which early on is no big deal. Three in the morning, as probably everybody here who's been here for a while knows, it gets pretty hectic if somebody has respiratory insufficiency at three in the morning because we just left the collar on and didn't check coughing. Uh, pain control. Usually all of these uh, patients with the lumbar decompressions are on a PCA. Um, so we usually try to start on either low or moderate. And uh, if it's somebody that's already using a lot of narcotics, because a lot of these patients that are um, getting these uh, fusions have been on narcotics, so they will end up on a higher uh, dose. <clears throat> Cervical fusion. Always have a drain. The purpose of this drain, it's the most important part of our whole surgery, is uh, to make sure that there's not a, a, a bleeder that goes on. It's slow, and sometimes it can be fast. We actually had a gentleman here that was a heavy smoker, and he just started <sighs> doing his morning cough, and he blew a vessel in his neck, um, where there was just a vein, but it immediately <sharp inhale> fills the thing, and it kept filling the drain. So that's your sign uh, for nursing or, or PT or anybody. If you see a full drain and you put another one on and it starts to fill up, you've got a problem. Um, we like to have our drains uh, emptied at half full because sometimes the vacuum isn't as strong inside of the drain. So as soon as it's half full, we say pop another one on. And if it fills up, you, you, again, that's the red flag to say, hey, I better call somebody. There's something bleeding here. Um, so it's real important if they're very full, they'll stop draining. That's another thing that we want the drains pulled because if it's a full drain, then there's probably more stuff in there that's not coming out. And, and if you guys, if, as nurses, if you're asked to pull the drain, which happens at times, when you pull a drain out, especially in the neck, remember to be like a Boy Scout or Girl Scout use direct pressure. So when the drain comes out, it's going to pull some of the veins that are just under the skin and it'll bleed. If that doesn't coagulate quickly and the hole seals up, now you're going to get a hematoma. So what I like to see happen is I take the patient's finger, because they're always awake enough to do this, you stick their finger on the drain hole and you tell them to hold it for about 10 minutes. Even while you're talking to them, instead of you, uh, you know, I don't want to stand there for 10 minutes. So Make the patient hold it. And then you leave the room, they're still holding it. You probably go in the next day and the person's still sitting there. <laughs> so if, if you go in and they're doing that, you can find yourself, okay, it's time. The doctor was here two hours ago, you can take your treatment. I have a question. So in the event, you know, you see your, your tube is filling and you think, oh my gosh, just took another one on and it fills. You should, as a nurse at the bedside, while they've been calling you to alert you to this, do we keep changing that? We're just evacuating that? Well, or do you think that it's... Yeah, Is it going to tamponade? I, no, 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 don't, 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 don't think that you can let it tamponade. If you walk by a patient who has a drain, it changes. If, if you're walking by and you're in a room and you have a patient has a drain and it's a, a teeny bit full but you don't know when it was changed, change it. Change. If we go in and there's 20 test tubes by the patient, that's great. Because anytime you think of it, change it. That way you're not having a drain with no suction. And um, even more so on that. So say you do it and it fills, yeah. and it fills. I would have somebody else call to say I've just placed three call, place a call in to us, and then someone should hold pressure on the neck. The only thing that will kill a patient after spine surgery in this hospital is a like a respiratory arrest in the middle of the night from a retropharyngeal bleed from any surgeon, whether it's a disc replacement an interior cervical, whatever, that's that's what kills people in the hospital quicker than anything else. 
on that note, we use, um, <laughs> uh, here at this hospital, we use an aspen collar. Um, uh, so single level patients, if you have one level, uh, I had a single level done in 2002, and I had to wear a collar for six weeks. Now the studies have shown that if you have a single level, you don't need to wear a collar. If it's a level at C34 and 67, it's two separated levels, you don't need to wear a collar. If they're two levels on top of each other, they need to wear a collar. If, if, and if, but if they don't have a collar, convince the person by the time they leave the hospital that they need to keep their neck still as if they broke their neck. So you don't want them leaving the hospital thinking, I don't have a collar, I better do some stretching and strengthening and start my yoga Pilates tomorrow. <laughs> convince them otherwise, convince them that you're lucky you don't have a collar, but you need to keep, you, you need to intentionally not try to regain motion for about six weeks. Just act like there's a collar on, act like you broke your neck. If someone would want a collar, would you give them a collar? Absolutely. We do that, in fact, not infrequently. If, if we, and, and at that point, we might give them a soft collar or we might give them a rigid collar. It depends. Yesterday we did it twice. One patient knew he has no self-control, and the other person is driving to, 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 to Pensacola tomorrow. So it just it depends. So we could just call you an issue then, a soft collar? You, you don't even have to call. If you, if you have somebody that asks for a collar or you think you would like to give them a collar, just write a phone order and do it. That's innocuous. Finally, on our necks, we're real famous for that. We do a subcutaneous closure, kind of a plastic surgery closure, so they don't end up with a scar. We also do that for uh, butterfly tattoos in the back. <laughs> mainly on our necks, we do plastic closures. I'm not kidding about that. <laughs>